Welcome. I am Thorsten Becker. I'm the chair of the Committee on Solid Earth Geophysics um, uh, and a member of the Board of Earth Sciences and Resources at National Academy of Sciences. It is my pleasure to introduce um, our spring meeting on glacial isostatic adjustment within a heterogeneous and evolving Earth system. Welcome to everybody here in the room and everybody online. Uh, participating in what proves to be uh, an exciting meeting. The uh, National Academies are the nation's preeminent source of expert evidence-based and objective advice on science, engineering, and health matters. The goal is to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation, and confront the challenging issues for the benefit of society. Among the activities are to serve as a neutral convening body to provide guidance on program direction and priorities, help resolve scientific or policy controversies, provide technical analysis, independent peer review, inform science policy debates, build and maintain scientific networks, which is what we're trying to help here, summarize state of the art and the sciences to audience of varying technical knowledge and increase the visibility of emerging scientific fields and policy issues. Within the Academy of Sciences, our committee uh, on solid earth geophysics has the goals of encouraging uh, advances in our understanding and in the review and scientific exchange regarding topics that involve earth structure, dynamics, and evolution. We seek to support community discussion and community agency and agency agency interactions within the field of solid earth system science. We wish to foster long-term efforts to collect, store, and disseminate related data in an open and inclusive way, including for monitoring of geodynamical events and nuclear test ban treaty considerations. To do this, um, we conduct a range of activities, including meetings such as this one. Uh, we support reports and uh, webinars, which can be accessed online. Um, the committee uh, is, in terms of its membership, it's listed here, and you will hear from some of my colleagues later in this meeting. Our sponsors are the Department of Energy, in terms of its Basic Energy Sciences and Geosciences Directorate, NASA, the Earth's Surface and Interior um, Division, the National Science Foundation, particularly Division of Earth Sciences, and the Earthquake Hazards Program of the United States Geological Survey, and we thank our sponsors for supporting these efforts. You can find out more about our committee uh, by following the link that is indicated here or taking a picture of the QR code you see on the right. We have an email list that we very much encourage you to join. And you can see a list here of past topics that illustrate some of the things that uh, we are excited about in terms of facilitating the discourse in these emerging fields, established fields, and um, we are very much trying to support the interactions between science and society within the context of the solid earth system. Uh, with this brief introduction, I would like to hand it over to my uh, colleague at the committee, Jeff Freimuller, who will introduce today's workshop. And I would like to thank everybody again for joining for this exciting meeting. Jeff. Thanks, Torsten. I'm Jeff Freimuller from Michigan State University. And uh, again, our title today is Glacial Isostatic Adjustment Within a Heterogeneous and Evolving Earth System. We have uh, two panels. Um, sorry, got to get rid of a message on my screen. Uh, we have two panels uh, today, two sessions. Um, I'll be moderator for the first session, and Jessica Warren will be moderator for the second session. So each uh, session has three speakers. On uh, the first uh, um, set, we have Rebecca Steffen from Lantmateria, Sweden, Lambert Caron from Caltech JPL, and Grace Neal from Durham University. Uh, and you can see the titles uh, there on the on the screen. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Rebecca Steffen. Um, and her title is Comprehending Glacial Isostatic Adjustment Models. What are they and what do they tell us? And uh, there, uh, those of you online, you can um, um, Join the discussion. There are a box for you to put in questions. We'll be uh, taking questions for the speakers and um, uh, moderating those questions as we go along. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca and if uh, she could share her screen and uh, begin the presentation. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. <clears throat> 
You are able to see my screen? Uh, we see, yes, we see your screen and uh, we see everything is ready. So uh, take it away. Thank you. Um, yes, first of all, I hear my echo. I think you have to mute the room. Um, so we're we're not. Oh, sorry. I'll 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 turn this off. Good. Perfect. Is it turned off? Yes. Looks like good. Um, yes. First of all, I would like to thank the committee for organizing this meeting and for inviting me to speak here today. Um, before I will talk about what GIA models are and what they tell us, I would like to give a short recap of what GIA is. And GIA is the response of the Earth to ice mass changes, which means that when we build an ice, when an ice sheet is built up, um, first of all, we take water out of the ocean, which means sea level is falling in most places. And in the regions beneath the ice sheet, we have uh, subsidence. And in the region surrounding this ice sheet, uh, in the peripheral bulge, we have uplifting shown by these arrows going upward. Um, this process is instantaneous in the beginning because um, a lithosphere and a mantle are reacting realistically. Um, if the loading is continuing for several hundred thousand of years, the mantle starts to behave viscously, and then we have mantle flowing away from this um, uh, subsidence region, and which means all that we have a kind of a time lag in this uh, process. If we, if the melt, ice sheet is now melting, we put water back into the ocean, which means that sea level is rising in most regions. And we have now uplifting in the regions where we had the ice before, while the peripheral bulge is collapsing and we have a subsidence. Because the mantle is still responding viscously to this uh, entire loading scenario, we still see this uplifting and, and entire GA response even ten, several 10,000 years after the ice is gone. But it's not only about the uplifting, subsidence, and sea level fall and rise that we see from GA. GA also induces or the ice loading induces stresses in the crust, which I will come back at a later point in my talk. And we also see a change in the location of the rotational axis when we uh, increase or decrease the ice sheet. So now that we all know what GA is, let's look at GA models. So for a GA model, we need input. One of the input is the ice model, as shown here. And this can be a paleo ice sheet history or recent ice mass changes. And once we uh, use an ice load in a GA model, we calculate also accompanying sea level changes because of the ice load, ice mass changes. And then we'll talk about the ice model development in the last talk today. Another input is the Earth's structure and rheology. And there we can have different parameters, mantle viscosity, lithosphere thickness, rheological parameters, and also different rheological models. And Harriet and Chicha will talk in the second part of the meeting today about these aspects. So now that we have two inputs, the ice loading and the Earth model, we can we have a GA model. And then we can produce various outputs. So 3D solid earth deformation, relative sea level change, heat rate change, and, and stress field rotation straight and strain rate. And the 3D solid earth deformation then also has an influence on the ice sheet evolution. And if we have these outputs, we also can compare our model to observations and then adjust our Earth model and or our ice model as an input for the GA model. And then we run the G model again. We want to make this comparison to observations to better understand the GIA process, um, also to get constraints on Earth rheology that can be used in many other applications, and then also constraints on uh, surface mass redistribution. So what is the purpose of the GIA model? We want to constrain uh, regional Earth viscosity and ice sheet histories. We also want to, of course, tune the model parameters and then are able to provide a calibrated model that can be used as a, in a variety of applications for the end user. What are these applications? Um, applications of a GA model are basically almost endless. There are so many uh, things that can be used where GA model can be used. For example, to estimate hydrological changes from satellite cavity data, but also estimating stress changes to find stable locations for nuclear waste storage or obtaining sea level projections. Before I talk a bit more about um, what 
we get from a GA model, uh, a short introduction, short history overview of a 3D GA modeling. It basically all started in 1935 with uh, Haskell when he estimated the mantle viscosities based on GA observations. And about 40 years later, Petit provided or published the first um, linear maximum model results. Um, maximum model is still one of the rheological models in GAA that is uh, commonly used. But meanwhile, different models are also applicable. Uh, only two years later, Farrell and Clark presented the sea level equation, which is necessary to get the accompanying sea level changes from the ice mass changes and the response of the solid earth. And at the same time, the GAA term was defined. And in the early 90s, Patrick Wu was the first one then to present the 3D GA model. And since then, there, were, there are many other groups developing codes that are also capable of uh, producing 3D GA model results. So let's look at observations. Um, GAA we can be seen in, in many fields. For example, using genetic observations, using GNSS data. We see here, this is an example for Northern Europe. The color scale shows the vertical velocity with a brownish reddish color showing uplift and the light green color showing subsidence, which we see in Northern Central Europe. While in the uh, famous Gandia, we see an uplifting signal with as up to 10 millimeters per year. And the arrows show us the uh, GNSS horizontal velocities, which are going away from this uplifting region. We can also see an uplift in Canada, shown by, now, by these red dots. And the blue dots show uh, subsidence in the peripheral bulge, um, which is uh, interestingly closely related to the Canadian US border. But we don't only we are not only see this uplifting and subsidence in regions that have been glaciated in the during the last glacier cycle, but also those in regions where we still have an ice sheet, for example, Greenland. And this also shows the vertical uplift, the uh, POGAA uplift most likely. So elastic um, elastic uplift is reduced, which is based on recent ice mass changes. And this leaves us with a mostly uplifting signal for the Greenlandic coast and a small region of subsidence closer to Canada. We can also use a technique of INSA to uh, look at the vertical velocities. And this is an example from uh, 2004 from Amandine Aurillac where she looked at the response of the solid earth to uh, glacier mass changes. And we see also up to 12 millimeters per year of uplift. And then we can also use geological data that show us something about the 3D land motion and also vertical land motion using lake levels in Canada to uh, over time to estimate where was uh, the, the lake level and showing us a tilting. Now, how does this compare to model output? And this is now a result from a more from a recent code development, a 3D GA code called FEM IBSF, uh, which is based on the paper by Ping Ping Huang. And we here we use I6G ice history together with a 1D uh, VM5A viscosity structure. But the code is the, capable of using also 3D structures. And what we see is now the vertical velocity, and this is uh, quite similar to what we observe also with GNSS data. We have uplifting in North America and Northern Europe. And in Greenland, it's kind of a mix area, right? same for Antarctica with more, mainly uplifting. But you see that the vertical velocity is not zero um, even for the entire world. We have even in other regions that are far, further away from the ice sheet that are responding to ice mass changes because of the change in the ocean load. And Grace Need will talk more about the GNSS aspect of GAA in her talk. Another genetic application where we can observe GAA is gravity changes. Uh, looking at the satellite data first, this is a trend from the Cray satellite data set. Um, the GOE height change, which is quite similar, giving us a quite similar result to what the uplifting we, we have seen before. We have uh, an up, GOE uplift in the North American region and also Northern Europe. And of course, we see something else in Greenland and Antarctica because we have the melting ice sheets. So Grace shows us GAA and many other processes that are ongoing. We can also observe gravity changes um, by ground observations. This is for a station in Finland where absolute gravity measurements have been taken for several years at the same location. 
and then we can make a, a yeah a nice uh, show a nice decrease in the gravity value. And this has been done for many locations in Northern Europe. And this is now the result of it. Looking at um, entire Northern Europe, we see an, a change, a negative uh, gravity change because the uh, land is uplifting, so the points are coming further away from the Earth's center. And so gravity is decreasing. So how does it compare now to the model output using the same model code as before? Looking at the GOE change, and this is quite similar to what we see from Quays. We see this uplifting region in North America and Northern Europe. And such a model could be now taken as a reduction model for Quays to remove the GIA component in Quays data. And Lambert will talk about this in, his, in the next talk in more detail. Another geodetic observation is Earth rotation changes. And here we can, for example, look at the polar motion, which means that the, the change in the uh, location of the Earth rotation axis, uh, as shown here, over from 1900 to 2000. We can also look at the change in the length of the day and compare this now to um, the model output again. Now we plot uh, also a polar plot. We calculate the modeled polar motion uh, change and compare to the observations shown by the green cross and the uh, orange star showing the modeled output. Of course, there is a mismatch because uh, it's not only GA that leads to polar motion. Um, a more geological observation of GA is relative sea level. And there we can go back many years, many ten, several tens of thousand years back in time. And uh, these data are also usually used to um, estimate the, or validate the ice models that are used for GA modeling. Then we can go more to more recent time. We can look at uh, tide gates. Uh, Stations. This is a result from all the tight gauge curve from Stockholm, where sea level is falling because Stockholm is in uh, Sweden and so it's uplifting the region. And then we have more recent data from altimetry, satellite altimetry, also telling us something about sea level change. And how does it compare to a model output? And here we could can plot the relative sea level rate. And we see, um, of course, in regions where we had the ice. The land is uplifting, so of course, sea level is uh, falling in, in that case. And another observation of GAA, which is not so often used, is seismicity. Um, what does it mean? So, for example, in Northern Europe, we have evidence that uh, earthquakes happened at the end of the class deglaciation or even during ice advance. And how these does this evidence look like? So for example, for Northern Sweden, we have the more, more famous fault, the Prairie Fault, and you can see a fault trace of this fault. And if you go to one of these locations on the ground, you can see a sharp increase in the landscape, which clearly says that, that there was an earthquake uh, after the ice was gone. And this is uh, also visible, or GA induced seismicity is also visible in uh, Central Europe, but there we don't see a such a clear uh, offset in the landscape, but they um, have soft sedimentation, soft sediment deformation structures, which tell us that an earthquake happened quite recently. And how then can we compare this to observation uh, to model output again? Now looking at the column failure stress changes um, to show to introduce you column failure stress. Uh, the column failure stress is the distance between the Mohr circle, which is defined by the principal stresses, and the line of failure. And easily saying, if we, uh, if this delta CFS is smaller than zero, which means that there is a distance between the circle and this line, then um, it, it's stable, which means the blue color in the plot down here. If the circle crosses this line, delta CFS is positive and it's unstable. We can have earthquakes. And what we see for the delta CFS for today is that we have unstable regions in almost entire Northern America and also in parts of Northern Europe. Um, and also for Antarctica. And you see that, uh, that, again, like with the vertical velocities, even in regions that um, haven't been affected by an ice sheet, we see a change in the column failure stress because we have ocean load changes as well, and GIA is a global process. I will focus now in the rest of my talk on this um, seismicity because we don't have only for Northern Europe these traces of glacially triggered earthquakes. We also see these in North America, Greenland, and even Antarctica. And um, 
to give you a bit back, more background why we get these uh, stress changes, why we, do we get earthquakes because of GAA. Um, so when we have a load, we induce stresses. One stresses are in the vertical direction. These are only the loading stresses and only exist beneath the ice sheet, which means that if the ice sheet is gone, these stresses are also gone. In addition to the loading stresses, we have flexural stresses in the lithosphere because the flexure is, as the lithosphere is bending because of uh, the loading. And these are acting in the horizontal direction. We have compression in the regions beneath the ice sheet, while we have extension as soon as we get out of the ice sheet and ice margin towards the peripheral bulge. And then we have an additional stress component, component which comes from the migration of stresses from the mantle into the lithosphere, which I will explain now. Um, so in the beginning of the loading, as I mentioned earlier, we have an instantaneous elastic response of the lithosphere and mantle, and those stresses are built up in both layers. If uh, when time of loading is continuing, like it was uh, for the last glacial cycle, the mantle starts to behave viscously, and then the stresses are transferred towards the elastic layer. And with continued loading, the mantle is completely reacting viscously, and the only elastic layer left is a lithosphere. And as a viscous layer cannot hold the stresses in the same way as an elastic layer, the stresses from the mantle are migrating, that were created in the beginning, are migrated towards the lithosphere. Which means that if we model glacially induced stresses, we cannot just use a lithosphere model, because then we miss this important aspect of stress migration next to many other aspects of GA modeling. But um, so it's important when we model stre GA stresses to use a lithosphere and a mantle model. In addition, stress migration means that if we take just the vertical ve or the velocity field from today or any other time in, uh, in the past and convert it to a strain field and also then convert the strain field to a stress field, this can be done by mathematical equations, we also miss the stress migration because this is then not included. Which means that when we want to model GA stresses, we have to use an entire GA model together with an ice loading history to get all three stress components. Now showing clearly the induced stresses for two examples. The first one is for Greenland. Again, blue is stable, red is unstable. And you can focus on the uh, bottom here. It goes from around 14,000 years until today. And you see how this re southern region of uh, Greenland is becoming unstable. Let's look at this uh, location down here. And uh, looking now at the data CFS over time from 20,000 years before present to today. And here is the ice load shown. We see an increase in the change in column fair stress around 10,500 years ago, which means that there is a likelihood for an earthquake. And in this uh, publication that was uh, published around, uh, about four years ago, we also present evidence that we might have had an earthquake there. Another example is glacially induced stresses in Arctic Canada. Again, we look at this column fair stress now shown on the right side. The left side shows the ice model history. Again, blue is stable, red is unstable. And just to give you a uh, short overview where you, we are. So this is Baffin Island. Here over here is Greenland, Elsmere Island. And here we have Somerset Island and Prince of Wales Island. And Hudson Bay is basically down here. Running this now again from the uh, during the last uh, glacial maximum to today, we see stable regions, but as soon as ice is gone, we, the region becomes unstable with quite large values of up to six megapascals. Again, looking at one specific location between Somerset Island and Prince of Wales Island, um, we know very um, also the Earth model, so showing the results of different Earth models. And what is quite interesting is that no matter what ice model Earth model we use the activation or the time when um, data CFS becomes positive is the same. This is not the same for the ice model. There we can have a large variety of uh, change in, in data CFS. And this can be between uh, 12 to up to 5,000 years before present for this location. So it's more important to know the ice model when we look at stresses than uh, looking at the Earth model. Um, to, at the end, I want to also mention about GA model uncertainty because a GA model is still just a computer model, which means that we have uncertainties that come from the model input parameters. This uh, diagram from Pippa Whitehouse uh, 
summarizes this nicely because if you look at a large ice loss at 10,000 years versus a small ice loss at 5,000 years, we still see the same observed present day uplift rate that we can see from GNSS data, similar for this other example down here. So it's important to also use several observations when we compare our model output, not just only one observation. Another aspect is that we might miss model physics or have uh, sim simplifications in the model setup that introduces some uncertainty. If we use, for example, a compressible model, which is more realistically, versus an incompressible model, easier to, to calculate, but uh, this can give us difference in the horizontal velocities as shown here. And these difference are larger than GNSS uncertainties are in a, have, to, have to be considered. So it's better to use a compressible model when looking at uh, horizontal velocities and even other GA model outputs. And with this, I would like to sum up already and thank you for your attention. And I hope you have learned something and have some questions. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I actually have one question while we wait to see if we have some from the audience. Um, you showed that for the continental ice sheets, uh, that knowing the ice model was much more important for understanding the stresses than than the Earth model itself. Um, is that also true when we look at, let's say, smaller ice masses in present day change? Is it mostly uncertainty or the ice model uncertainty or does the Earth model uncertainty become more uh, important in that case? Um, honestly, we don't know. <laughs> Um, but I, I would say the ice model is the most important constraint that we have. Um, we have to know the ice model better for the stress changes. And then we can look also if we, the Earth model changes tell us more. We have one more question in the room here. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering, given the uncertainties about the background stress levels and amplitudes of triggering stresses, if you've looked at the style of the stress change as might be reflected in geological records of changes in how faults are loaded or as for the present day in terms of the focal mechanisms to see if you can divvy out where you're actually seeing those stress changes due to GI. Um, we see uh, these stress changes. No, I'm echoing again. Um... Yeah, we see the stress changes um, when we look at these uh, previous faults. Um, for if you look at Antarctica, we can also look at the, the more recent earthquakes, of course. Um, but this hasn't been touched yet so far because also the Antarctic ice model is not good enough at the moment to look at these because we know we need to have good ice model. Um, and then the background stresses is, is an issue in our stress estimates, definitely. And we always assume that we have a critically stressed crust which is a kind of valid assumption according to the seismologists. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. I think we'll need to move on to our second speaker, Lambert Caron. Uh, we may have time for more questions at the end of the first panel. So um, Lambert, are you uh, ready? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I'm yeah, I'm I'm just waiting for my slide. Okay, good, good. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Yes, I need to just look in the same direction. Okay, so yeah, thank you for inviting me today. So I I want to touch on two main topics today. Um, one is explaining a little bit, um, what what GIA uncertainties are limiting in terms of the interpretation of geodetic data. And the second part of my talk would be um, trying to understand where this uncertainty comes from and how it might change in the future when people revisit certain aspects of the modeling. Next slide, please. Okay, so for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with GRACE data, um, so it is a mission composed of a pair of satellite and the main instrument on board is a radar that measures the distance between the two satellites. And the principle is uh, when the first satellite goes over um, the point of, of the Earth where there's an excess of mass, it's gonna accelerate due to that gravitational attraction. And then the distance between the two satellites will increase. 
And then the second satellite will catch up to the first one when it passes that same excess of mass and uh, essentially resume the baseline distance. Um, and then the opposite will happen if the pair of satellite goes above an area which is uh, uh, has a negative uh, mass anomaly. And so in this way, we can uh, image the uh, distribution of mass uh, over the, uh, the solid Earth. And um, so there's the really di three different levels of products that the GRACE mission give us, gives us access to. Level one has to, uh, to do with the instrument. So it's gonna be the ranging itself, um, as well as other uh, properties like the satellite clock that's on board. Uh, um, and then the level two um, is the interpretation of that data in terms of gravity field. Um, so there's, we, we know we have a mathematical framework uh, to uh, translate that ranging into a, a set of gravitational attraction. But we have to make a few steps, uh, a few corrections to get there, um, remove the non-gravitational acceleration when the pair of satellites is correcting for the right orbit. There's thrusters that are going to set the satellites back into the path when they have to move away from an obstacle. Um, and then um, level three is what most users want. And it doesn't have to do with the gravity data in and of itself, but rather the interpretation of that data in terms of distribution of mass at the surface of the earth. And then the biggest communities uh, that use GRACE data, um, well, they wanna know what the distribution of water mass is and not distribution of mass within the solid earth. So we're gonna talk about uh, communities in the hydrology, uh, physical oceanography, and then as well, the people that study the cryosphere. But to get there, we need to remove from the gravity signal, the path that is due to the solid earth itself. And so within these corrections to go from level two to level three is remove GIA that I highlighted here. And then that's, that's kind of the main point that we're, we'll see today. Next slide, please. Okay. so. Um, I'll give you a few examples of what type of data we can see in gray. So this, this is a comparison between two uh, different months. Um, and what you see in color here is the mass anomaly at these two periods. So we had a really intense drought in Southern California a few years ago. And that's why you see these intense red colors. It was large drought, which means a negative mass anomaly. There was no water, so low mass. And then uh, after a very rainy winter, we got that picture that was almost on average zero, even maybe a little bit blue. So we can see that in the GRACE data, the resolution is not very high, but the, the quality of the data is very clear. Um, and if we look at the GIA correction from our model here, um, the uncorrected GRACE before removing uh, GIA will be somewhere around 13 millimeter equivalent water height. And then once you correct it, you're gonna remove Four, four millimeters here, and you'd be left with about nine. And the error is about 2.5. So it's, this is not too bad. This is not, uh, if we get GIA wrong, we'll not misinterpret that data. The other thing I wanted to show here is that we're gonna talk a lot about uh, trends today, but there's also valuable information found um, at the interannual and seasonal timescales. Next, next slide, please. Um, one of the main applications and the clear signal you'll see in GRACE is the changes in the ice sheets. Uh, there's a very, very strong signal coming from there, especially it's very consistent across time. So these are the time series that I extracted from um, the integration of mass over the entire uh, areas of Greenland and Antarctica. And um, so we're talking about several hundreds of uh, gigatons per year of mass loss. And the GAA correction for this area, it's pretty small for Greenland, although there's a big uncertainty on my, on my part here. Um, but over Antarctica, there's a roughly the same order of magnitude between the GAA correction and GRACE before the GAA correction. So you nearly double the estimate once you do the GAA correction. So there, having the right model matters more. And there's some disagreement, uh, although the field is starting to get better at this over this region. Next slide, please. Um, and then the final, uh, let's say, community that uses GIA is the 
community of physical and oceanography, and there's a particular interest in the Northern Atlantic um, because we tentatively see a, a low mass trend in the North Atlantic and that could correlate with a weakening of the ocean circulation, which could have really big consequences for the climate. So we need to know whether that's true or not. Um, and as we'll see, there's, there's, it's really difficult to interpret. Next slide, please. So I put here uh, the uh, together the 20 years times uh, trend from GRACE that's corrected from GA already at the top left. And then uh, at the bottom left is my estimation of what the mean GA correction is. And then you'll see to the right of that, the GA uncertainty. Now, the interesting part is how do you compare the corrected GRACE with the GA uncertainty. If you do the ratio between the two, that's A divided by D here, then you'll get an idea of the areas where the GA uncertainty limits the interpretation of the trends, right? So if you're in the region where the gray signal is between zero and one sigma of GIA, there's not much you can conclude from the trends. Could go either way because it's smaller than the GA uncertainty. If you're between one and two sigmas, you can tentatively interpret, but with a lot of caution, because there's a lot of chance that you know an error on the GA could compromise what you're concluding here. If you're between two and three, you can make a good case for the trend being uh, reliable. And then if you're above three, yes, it matters that you do remove GIA, but you're not gonna be wrong if you pick the wrong model. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show with that uh, map. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Oh, that's the previous one. Thank you. Yeah, so this is just a blow up of that map from before. And then you can see a few areas which are important. Uh, over North America, you're in that zero to one sigma um, um, uh, order of magnitude. And that means it's really difficult to interpret the hydrology changes, at least in the trends, over that region. Um, there's also, we talked about the Northern Atlantic and whether or not uh, weakening of the ocean circulation was happening. Well, that's also in the, in the area because it's so close to the Laurentide where we can't really conclude what the trend is doing. There's too much uncertainty. Um, and then the last point I wanted to show is uh, East Antarctica, even though this is showing that you can have re reasonable confidence if you look at now, not just my model ensemble, but also what other uh, people in the community have modeled then it gets really difficult uh, to interpret what's going on because we have a poor understanding of the ice history in that region. Next slide, please. Okay, and that's sort of what you can see here. This is from IMBI, and they had different methods to interpret the uh, mass change in Antarctica from different parts. And what you can see here is that the total mass trend over Antarctica, that's the purple line, is pretty well aligned and dominated by West Antarctica. But the uncertainty is mostly looks like the uncertainty that you have on East Antarctica, and that's because of GIA, because we, again, know little about the uncertainty over there. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you make a huge big picture of how we construct these forward models and uncertainty estimates, these, these are the, to, my, uh, to me, these are the big categories of inputs you need to consider and frameworks. So as Rebecca said, on one part, we have ice history, we have rheology, and both of these have contain um, differences between estimates and uncertainties. You'll put together that into a, a particular model, and then that's where we may have these disagreements over the physics. We need to agree on what the constraining data is, and we don't. Like, no, we don't all use the same data set. Then we need to agree how we use that in the cost function. Are we grouping the data? What are we doing when we mix in GPS with relative sea level data, for example? And then out of all these ingredients, then we have an uncertainty estimates. Next slide, please. So these are all the uh, questions I ask myself when I put together a joint model where I'm going to interpret some kind of uncertainty quantification from a model ensemble. Next slide, please. Okay, so there are some considerations to have as to why these uncertainty exist. So it's not just that the inputs are not known perfectly, there are some specific problems that cause the result to have significant uncertainty. 
One is that we don't have even data distribution. So this is the common case among other geophysical fields, but I wanted to show you here the distribution that we're dealing with. So um, this is a combination of relative sea level data. Um, and in red here are the GPS size that I used in this 2018 paper. So you see they're mostly concentrated around the last uh, areas of the glaciation, makes sense. And then sparsely, I would say in the far field, uh, we have some coal data and other, other such data. Um, so big spatial gaps. And we move on to the next slide. If you look at it in time, that's the, the graph on the right. This is uh, data distribution again versus time and then longitude. So you can match it with the map. And here, what you see is that we have mostly information over the last 10,000 years and then few fewer uh, amount of data before 10,000 years ago. And that's where most of the active deglaciation happened. So it's difficult to deal with it because we're sort of biased towards the recent. Next slide, please. Okay, additionally, this is an example of a particularly, I would say, bad uh, site for relative sea level data. There are some problems that we can see in the data, some limitations that explain why we can fit several models with different inputs in there. One is that uh, the quality of the data is not necessarily um, sufficient to rule out a lot of parameter combinations. So you can see here, especially on the latter part, there are some gaps in the data. There's some sometimes biases because the geological data can be reworked or there's some problem with the datation. And there's also missing data from the uh, early phase of the deglaciation. So this all means that several uh, curves could fit in that time series. Next slide, please. Um, nonetheless, I would say this is one of still the only source of time dependent data. And as Rebecca showed, this is have what we have to work with right now. So how are we going to derive uh, uncertainty estimates at all from here? So I show you here now my approach to it. Um, so I, I take the simplest model I can, I can do. So a three layers mantle with upper mantle, lower mantle, and lithosphere. And I'm going to vary the, the viscosity structure in there. And then I'm also trying to uh, quantify the uncertainty that stems from the ice history. We don't have really have good ways to do that right now uh, because ice models are expensive to run. And so my approach has been, let's try to at least rescale uh, the ice history by region. We'll take ice 5G or we'll take the model from the ANU and then say, we'll, we'll try to modify that, put 10% more ice in Antarctica and then you know, lower a little bit the, the, uh, for ice volume in Finoscandia and see what happens. So this way you can have some big picture idea of the uncertainty from the ice history. So we, you put that together and then you can generate just a, a, a bounty of forward models because they are cheap to run in this way. Um, and then this is an example of uh, these uh, model ensemble on the, on the right where you have several curves of uh, GIA model and then in black are the data. And you can see we can attribute certain uh, weights based on the model performance here. And then from this set of forward curves, we can derive GIA statistics. That's how we do it. And then I put the formula for the probability here. So it's a probabilistic approach to uncertainty. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you get the result of that, the nice thing is you don't really have to assume much else in terms of error and uh, error structure. And what you get is uh, a probabilistic representation of the parameter you put in there. So these are the marginal probability distributions for the lithospheric thickness, upper mental and lower mental viscosities. And you can see they have some interesting properties. They don't look Gauss like Gaussian structures. They are asymmetric. They might be multimodal and um, yeah, they, they, there's not there's not really a, a, a formula that you can easily fit to these curves, but they are very interesting nonetheless. Uh, could we move on to the next one? Yes. So if you one thing to consider if you look at that is that most people will try to optimize their model parameters to find the best fit. If you do that here, you obtain you obtain the uh, black cross, and so it what's 
interesting to see here is that this is very different from sort of the average model that you would get from this, even if you weigh it by the probability. And it's not so far away from the estimate that uh, you get from IS 5G VM 5A, for example, or IS 6G. Um, so big difference between average model and best fit models because of that asymmetry. Next slide, please. And if you do that in 2D now, so you're looking at the probability map versus two parameters at the same time, then you can start to see the correlation between these parameters. And again, what you see here, it's multimodal and the, the correlation is not linear. So you have this interesting saturation effect after a certain amount of uh, viscosity, you don't change the relaxa relaxation curve because there's no viscosity uh, ac active at all. Um, yeah, so this is an interesting property of Monte Carlo uh, type of uh, model explorations. And you're trading the simplicity of the physical model for the complexity of the error structure that you can get in this way. Next slide, please. So this was for Maxwell biology, so very traditional. And I did try in my PhD to switch that to Berger's biology. Um, so it's a model that features a transient relaxation as, uh, as uh, in addition to the steady state. And what you see is that you, you do get something that's similar, but now the probability is shifted and that multimodality is toned down. So interestingly, we can measure uh, random uncertainty very well with MCMC, but we need to remember that we also have structural uncertainty that is baked in the assumptions of the models that we use. So for example, the type of rheology, but also whether or not you use a um, IC, IC3 model that is physical or just empirical. Next slide, please. All right, so I just take the, uh, the case of rheology here to, to make that point. So on one side, you can have the simplest 1D Maxwell model, not many layers that you can have. The advantage is that it's cheap and you can probably compute a forward model in minutes, it depends on your exact uh, technology. It is affected by more biases because you know it's less realistic. It's, it doesn't have all these fancy um, physics that we know are probably true, uh, but it makes non-uniqueness non -uniqueness easy to explore. Now on the other side, you have everything that we are trying to do today, uh, to transient rheology, 3D structures, maybe a fine radial um, structure that matches more the tomography uh, models that we have. And this is hard to quantify if you look at it from an uncertainty perspective because it has many degrees of freedom. Next slide, please. And so there is a tendency to have, um, to move towards more physical complexity in the models, which we very much need because we need to reduce the biases that's in our models. But oftentimes that will mean we need to think about how to not lose the information that we're getting from the uh, error structure. And so we sort of have a gradient here of different methods we can use to explore IC3, um, model uncertainty. So on one side, you could have methods that allow you to get arbitrary distribution functions like Monte Carlo method. And then in the middle, you get something where the error is linearized, but you can still look at it. Uh, so that would be method like least squares or geo joint. Um, and then maybe the simplest you can get is just compute a handful of forward model and you'll get a, an order of magnitude of the error. And then all at the way, sorry, all the way at, at the end, you have, I didn't do the uncertainty over that parameter. And then the important thing to remember is that you might have a different scheme for each of the boxes that I highlighted before. So one scheme for the rheology and a different one from the IC history. And then maybe you won't look at other inputs of the model at all. So it's a mix and we all sort of do that. Next slide, please. Uh, maybe, so we're looking, several groups are looking into emulators to fix that problem, make a model that's both realistic and cheap. Uh, you do need to train the model, but that's a possible avenue that we're only starting to now really exploit, I would say. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I get to my uh, take home messages here. Um, so again, the first thing we saw is that there are regions of the, the globe where uh, geodetic data um, is complicated to interpret because GI is in the way and the uncertainty of GI is too big compared to the signal. 
Um, there's mostly two categories for that uncertainty uh, to come from. There's biases, structural uncertainty, and then there's parametric uncertainty or random variables. Um, and then um, I would say ultimately that the uncertainty comes from the, the fact that our constraining data is imperfect and leaves room for all these uh, different models to have either a similar prediction or just a different prediction, but not you know, not big enough, not big enough that it's going to exceed the model uncertainty. And then there's a trade off between the model, com the complexity, physical complexity, and the complexity of the error structure that we get. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Lambert. One one quick question. I think you know historically the ice models were usually optimized along with the Earth models, with the rheology models, which creates a trade-off essentially between ice history and in rheology, just from the optimization itself. How close are we to having ice models that are not really tied to a particular rheological model that you could fully sort of treat them as independent variables? We're not close to that. I don't think we will ever be able to do that actually. Um, unless maybe somehow we get so much geological data that we can have constraints that are independent of the deformation itself, we're not going to be able to do that. The, our knowledge of the past ice history is tied to these relative sea level curves, and there's no way we can't do both at the same time. I think what will happen is that we'll get better at inverting them jointly. One more, one more question here. Actually, two, two more questions from the committee, and then we'll move on to the third speaker. And the, for those of you who are online, if you have questions for the speakers, start queuing them up. We'll have a Q&A period after the third talk. So Torsten and then uh, Steve. So it seemed like you were able to reduce the bimodality in those uh, trade-off plots by introducing the transient burger rheology. But that transients, if I saw correctly, would then apply for the lower mantle. And so I was wondering if you think that's that's true transient behavior, or maybe that's actually spatially mismapped three D variations in viscosity. So from from the pure uh, cost function, it it might you might be able to get away with doing a different refining of the mantle and and mostly solve it, but from a theoretical point of view, and I think. Uh, Harriet will talk about that. There's not really any reason to dismiss all the evidence that we have that there's going to be multiple uh, relaxation time for the same material, and that's true for all depth of the mantle. So the lower mantle and the upper mantle most definitely have a component that is transient, and we we just need to be able to see if we how we can constrain that within the resolving power of the data. So uh, you did a good job of telling us how complex the problem is, but I'm wondering, say, if the community wanted to make a big advance in J.A. Mountain in the next decade, say, uh, what are the, I don't know if there's any low-hanging fruit, but where where should we put our efforts in terms of J.A. research? So we are we're already well engaged to tackle the existing biases in the model space. I think the community is doing a really good job of doing that. Um, something else that the community is working on, but maybe gets less visibility is more standardization of the of the way we, we constrain the model. So what uh, compilation of data we all use for now is still very different. There are some efforts to standardize that, for example, whole C. Um, they're doing a common database, which means all the data will be treated the same. And hopefully more of the community will rely on the same data sets to arrive to the same uh, problem. Um, and then the, the other part of that question is, how do we tie in these different data sets, the GPS, the gravimetry, the paleo sea level data into one cost function? Because um, again, there's no standardization. So we all come up with different answers because we do the cooking a little bit differently. Okay, thanks. We'll move on to the, the third uh, talk in uh, in this uh, group, which is uh, from Grace Neild from Durham University. 
And uh, Grace's title is Constraining Short and Long-Term GIA with GPS Time Series. And again, for those of you online, uh, please go into the box and add your questions and we'll have a Q&A period uh, after Grace's talk. Okay, great. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, it's all good, Grace, ready to go. Perfect. Uh, go ahead, Grace. We're uh, we're ready for yeah. you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to find my laser pointer. It's disappeared. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, constraining GIA with um, GPS time series. Um, and I really I'm coming at this from a modeling perspective. I'm not a, a sort of a GPS data person, but I would really like to acknowledge all the people listed on the slide there, amongst many others who have put in a tremendous amount of effort to install these networks and to process the data so that modelers like me are able to use them. So what is GPS or GNSS? Um, I kind of use these two terms interchangeably. That's not strictly accurate. Um, GPS is a type of GNSS, um, but, but I'll stick with GPS just for this uh, presentation. So there are stations all over the world recording very precisely the Earth's movement. So that's things like tectonics and seismic deformation tidal motions, earth rotation, and why we're all here today, glacial isostatic adjustment. This is an example of um, a GPS site in Antarctica. And you can see the monument there that's bolted into the bedrock. And then we have the GPS aerial in the radome sat on top. There's also associated equipment with that as well to provide um, power and um, to transmit the data. So for many regions of the world, um, it's fairly straightforward to install these things, but for the regions where we want to measure GIA, such as Greenland and Antarctica, there are other um, considerations for installation. We need to have bedrock that has to be ice free, and in some regions of Antarctica, that's quite tricky to find. We need to have power so that they can keep running through the long, dark winters, and they have to be accessible either by ship or by an um, aeroplane. So how are GPS used to constrain um, GIA models? Well, Rebecca introduced this really nicely earlier on. The simplest way is just to compare our model predictions to the GPS observations. So we have our two inputs to our GIA model. We have the ice history and the earth structure. They feed into the GIA, GIA model and those predictions can be compared to observations. So with these three components of the system, actually, if we know two of them, we've got a really good chance of trying to figure out the third one. So, for example, if we know our ice history really well, and that does happen if we're, we're looking at ice history over the past couple of decades rather than over thousands of years. So if we assume we know our ice history really well and we've got our GPS um, observations, we can use these two aspects to constrain our um, Earth structure. So GPS can also be combined with satellite altimetry and gravity data to derive empirical estimates of GIA. I'm not going to talk any more um, about that in this talk. So having a look at the GPS networks, um, we've got the Greenland network, the GNET um, stations. These are really nicely distributed around the coast of Greenland. Um, and that really helps uh, to have that spatial distribution to constrain the GIA models. In Fenescandia, Rebecca already showed a really nice plot um, from this network. There, there's a really dense network um, all across this, this region of Fenescandia and the surrounding areas um, with which to constrain the GIA models. And that's because uh, it's all ice free. Down in Antarctica, there are several GPS networks in operation. In addition to the IGS sites, there's the Polnet sites, the, the UK ANET network, and the CADA GIA network. 
And in Antarctica, it's a real sort of international effort to kind of keep these stations going. And um, it really needs a kind of multidisciplinary approach. So many stations are actually co-located with um, seismometers, for example. So this figure here, courtesy of Terry Wilson, shows continuous measurements of bedrock vertical land motion from around Antarctica. And you can see actually a relatively dense network of stations across much of West Antarctica. Now you'll notice one very obvious thing from this plot, and that's these absolutely enormous uplift rates that we see from the Amundsen Sea sector of West Antarctica. And these, these rates are um, around five centimeters per year. And that is just a phenomenal amount of uplift that we wouldn't be able to see without these, these GPS um, stations. The other thing that you might have noticed is that there's a change from uplift to subsidence over relatively short spatial scales. So we're actually seeing subsidence uh, really quite close to, to this area of, of huge uplift. And also in the Antarctic Peninsula, we see uh, subsidence at these two sites here, which is, uh, and they are around 100 kilometers from um, uplifting areas. So having this dense network really helps us to capture these kinds of changes. Unfortunately, um, there's an uncertain future for these, these GPS networks. The USA Net Network or the, the Polnet Network is due to be decommissioned next year. And if that happens, that has a pretty devastating impact. It leaves a massive amount of West Antarctica unmonitored. And, that, and particularly for the Amundsen Sea region, um, which is the region of rapid change, um, that loss is, is quite devastating, really. For the UK ANET network, so that covers much of the Antarctic Peninsula and a few sites over in Coatsland, that was also due to be decommissioned by next year, but I'm pleased to be able to say that we're going to keep around half of those stations within the network, and that's due to continued support from the British Antarctic Survey and that there are other applications of this network. So moving on to East Antarctica now, we're focusing on this huge area of coastline all around the east. This figure, courtesy of Matt King, shows five different GIA model outputs um, for, that, for that section of East Antarctic coast. And you can immediately see absolutely huge differences between these models, both in terms of the magnitude and also the spatial pattern. So this really shows that um, GPS stations are needed here to constrain this, uh, these model outputs. So this figure just shows the, the RMS between those models, along with the uh, long running sites in yellow and also GPS stations that have been installed since 2016 in the pink triangles. There are more stations planned across this region, as shown in this figure with the green dots, and that would really help massively to sort of fill in the gaps between uh, these other stations and really help with um, constraining those GIA models. Okay, so what is in a GPS time series? Well, if you've never really looked at one before, it might look something like this. And um, this is raw GPS data from O'Higgins, which is in the uh, Northern Antarctic Peninsula. So we have an east displacement and north displacement and a vertical displacement. And we might see things like outliers in the, in the data time series or, or gaps where the power might have gone off or the equipment might have stopped working for some reason. And all of this um, raw data needs processing. We might also see offsets and um, from, for example, instrument changes. And um, like you can see in this example down here, the instrument was changed and it causes um, a large offset in the data. And these are the kinds of things that need correcting before people like me can use them um, for constraining models. And of course, there are many geophysical signals that are being recorded in there and climate processes. So I'm just going to illustrate um, why we want to keep these GPS time series and why it's important to have um, longer continuous data. This is a vertical 
um, GPS time series from Palmer, which is in the Northern Peninsula here. You can see about nine years worth of data here. And I think we'd all be quite happy to put a straight line through that and say, yeah, that's our GIA rate and, and we can use that for constraining our models. However, that doesn't tell us the full picture. This station's actually been operational since 1998. And if we look at that full time series, we can see quite large deviations from that, um, that, that uh, inferred rate at the beginning and at the end. And actually in the past few years, this station looks like it's been subsiding. So this is one of the reasons why we really want to um, be able to keep these stations active and continue recording data. These longer time series give us more reliable rates. So one of the other signals that um, could be in the data and um, it could be contaminating the data if you're trying to use it for GIA purposes is post seismic deformation. So you might not think that this is much of an issue in Antarctica, but actually um, it is. So this was first looked at by King and Santa Maria Gomez in 2016, and they looked at this earthquake that happened around 600 kilometers from the east coast of Antarctica. So this 1998 earthquake was, was really large. It was 8.2 magnitude. And uh, luckily there was a GPS station active at this time. And this, these time series showed um, a large offset at the time of the earthquake, which corresponds to the cold seismic offset, and then subsequent post seismic deformation, which is the viscoelastic relaxation of the lower crust and upper mantle um, due to that large stress change. Over in the Antarctic Peninsula, the same thing is happening. There was a large earthquake that happened in 2013, a magnitude 7.7. .7. This happened around 700 kilometers from the tip of the peninsula where there's a GPS currently active. This is the O'Higgins GPS time series. There's a large cold seismic offset again at the time of that earthquake and subsequent uh, post seismic deformation. So not only is this an interesting signal to look at in its own right, but it could contaminate um, the, the GPS time series or the inferred rates if we're trying to use those to constrain our GIA models. So having a look at some um, long-term and short-term GIA now. So just to be clear what I'm talking about when I talk about long versus short-term. So the long-term GIA is um, that that's already been introduced really nicely by Rebecca. So this global response to deglaciation from the last glacial maximum. So we're talking about millennial timescale changes, this sort of long, slow response where we have high viscosity mantle of around 10 to the 21. When I talk about short-term viscoelastic deformation, this is was focusing on these, the sort of bedrock deformation part of GIA rather than um, the, the sea level um, the sea level changes. This is more relevant for regions with low viscosity and um, we're talking sort of 10 to the 18. So that's several orders of magnitude lower than the global average. And these regions are um, responding to ice loading changes on sort of years to decades to century timescales. So our long-term GIA, this is an example of the I6G model for North America. And you can see the background color here is the model predicted uplift or subsidence rates. And the dots there show the GPS observed uh, rates. And by comparing the model with the, the GPS observations, this can highlight regions where there's deficiencies in the model. Perhaps the ice loading model is not quite right or um, points towards needing a different earth structure. So down in Antarctica, this is the W12 GIA model. The background of that, that figure there shows the model outputs and the dots show the GPS observations. And these authors did the same thing. They compared the model predictions with observations. So anything that plots along that dashed line gets it absolutely perfect. And anything that plots away from that line shows deficiencies in the model. So the authors noticed that the, uh, in the model significantly overpredicts uplift rate in the Antarctic Peninsula. So they tried to adjust the model by adding ice loading in the last 2000 years of the model run 
to try and um, get a better fit between the model and the observations which they did. Of course, subsequently, um, you know, it's become apparent that that this mismatch is due to uh, deficiencies in the 1D Earth structure rather than um, the Earth model. So moving on to, to short term now um, in the Northern Antarctic Peninsula. So the Larsen B ice shelf collapsed in 2002 and subsequently glaciers feeding the former ice shelf began to speed up and lose mass. And this was recorded in elevation change data. So luckily, there's the Palmer GPS station, which is operational over here on the west of the peninsula. And this showed um, a, a really clear change in uplift rates in early 2002, which coincides with that ice shelf breakup. So it was hypothesized that this uplift was due to a purely elastic response of the solid earth um, due to that ice mass loss. But when we did the, the modeling for that, um, even within the uncertainty bounds of the ice mass change data, we didn't get an uplift rate that, that matched that GPS or got anywhere close. And actually we needed about four times the amount of ice mass loss to get anywhere near that, that GPS recorded uplift. So we deduced that this must be a viscoelastic response and running um, a viscoelastic model, we were able to test um, different earth properties and constrain the upper mantle here to be one times 10 to the 18 or around that value. So there are lots of regional studies like this that have used GPS time series and recent ice mass changes to deduce the um, upper mantle viscosity. So there's been um, a subsequent one in the Northern Peninsula and in Marguerite Bay, there's been ice loss since 2002. Um, and also notably in the Amundsen Sea sector, um, Bala in 2018, um, constrained the upper mantle viscosity there to be around four times 10 to the 18. And there's also um, another study looking at slightly longer decade or time scale um, ice loading changes. So we can use these sort of regional studies and compare the values that have been derived with um, data sets such as the ANT 20 seismic velocity model. So this shows relative variations in Earth structure um, across Antarctica. And we can compare the values derived by these studies to um, those derived from um, data sets such as this from seismic velocity models, and thereby we can build up a picture of a um, 3D Earth structure. Okay, so I, the last example I want to show is um, some work that I've been doing in the past year, and this is looking at the potential viscoelastic response to surface mass balance variability. So surface mass balance anomalies, um, you can broadly think of those as kind of large snowfall events. And I use the, the RACMO data sets of surface mass balance and um, removed the long-term mean to find out where the large anomalies are. And you can see um, that time series here um, for the last sort of 20 years. And this is for um, one location on the Antarctic Peninsula. And we can see hovering around zero, we can see large positive and negative anomalies. So um, that's the location just there. In 2014, there was this large uh, negative anomaly, followed quite swiftly in 2016 by a large positive anomaly. And you can see um, the, this kind of spatial pattern of distribution um, along the, the west of the peninsula there. So we ran this through an elastic model and compared the model predicted time series with the GPS observed time series at these three sites in the sort of mid peninsula there. And we can compute the WRMS or the misfit between the model predictions and the GPS time series. And then rerunning that with a viscoelastic model with an upper mantle viscosity of two to three times 10 to the 18. We do see quite a large difference actually at these sites. And in fact, the, the misfit reduces at all of these sites. Now, this is significant because um, surface mass balance variability um, the sort of elastic response to that is usually corrected out of GPS before it's used for GIA and um, to constrain GIA models. 
But this work is really showing that in regions of low viscosity, we need to also consider this viscoelastic signal as well. So just to sum up, um, GPS observations provide important insights into how the Earth is deforming and can provide a really useful tool to constrain GIA models. This is why we need to keep the networks going um, as long as possible. Long time series are important and they get more accurate the more data that we have. And also for regions of rapid change, um, long time series can um, record uh, these interesting signals. There are challenges in separating the signals that um, these sites are recording, both geophysical and non-geophysical. But this also provides us with opportunities to understand more about how the Earth is deforming. And I think um, in regions of rapid change or low viscosity, we should really move towards a more sort of time series approach rather than estimating rates. Um, and that's because um, the low viscosity means that the Earth is responding really quickly to, to different events. And I think we can learn a, a lot more by um, using a time series approach. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Grace. You showed very nicely how um, the uh, viscosity varies with space uh, in Antarctica. Um, with the pump seismic studies, are, are those getting similar viscosities or are those getting different uh, viscosity estimates um, or are the are the are the locations too different to actually make a comparison uh, that's that's a good question um so yeah so um for the northern peninsula um this is actually the best fitting model from um the subset that we tried um, it actually preferred a Burgers model, as you might expect for the post seismic, and um, so for the for the Northern Peninsula, we constrained um, a steady state of four times ten to the eighteen. So yeah, that matches quite well with what we're seeing from these short term viscoelastic deformation um, studies. Okay, thanks. We'll have a couple more questions from the committee, and then I'll turn it over to some questions from the uh, audience. So first, Barbara, and then Thorsten. Yes, thank you uh, for the nice talk. Uh, when I also have a question about the viscosity. When you quote numbers of 10 to the 18 Pascal seconds, and you say this is for the upper mantle, is that the entire yeah. upper mantle? Can you distinguish uh, like the asthenosphere versus the, or the low viscosity zone? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and based on... Um, the, the simplicity of the models. The models are quite often three layer. So we set these kinds of values for the whole of the, the upper mantle or at least down to around 400 kilometers depth. So um, yeah, it's kind of, it's hard to, to add any more layers in to kind of differentiate that. And um, particularly with some of these short-term loading studies where the, um, the actual ice mass change that, that is occurring is on quite a small spatial scale. So that would only penetrate down to around 250 kilometers kind of depth. Um, so we, yeah, we can only say that those values are representative that that uppermost mantle. Thank you. Following up a little bit uh, on that, I thought the different sources of decadal time scale variations were really fascinating. And you mentioned post seismic, you mentioned recent deglaciation, but then there are also these climatic cycles where you have larger ice pack, larger snow loads and things like that. And mm -hmm. I guess to some extent, they're superimposed everywhere, these effects, but I think there, there may be, or maybe there are places where one feature is more dominant than another. And I was wondering if you could sort of zoom out a little bit and point out where the challenges are in terms of having these signals superimposed and where there are opportunities to use them, right? Is Are there places where we can use them to say more about recent deglaciation and things like that? Yeah, I think um, West Antarctica really gives us that opportunity because of that low viscosity um, upper mantle. We're going to be able to see that viscoelastic deformation um, from all that's going on. And I really think that one of the big challenges is untangling these different signals. 
um from the time series um so yeah i think um particularly the amundsen c sector where we see these huge um, deformation signals might help us tease out a little bit more and separate these signals a little bit more um in contrast in east antarctica where we've got quite high viscosity we can be fairly certain that we're only going to see an elastic response so we can almost use that to validate the models a little bit um, because we can be quite confident that we're only going to see a, an elastic response to anything that's happened over a sort of decade or time scale. So, yeah, that's a bit of an opportunity, I think, really. OK, I'll go with a question that is from our online audience. Um, so this comes from Thomas Givens, and he was asking about Iceland, but it, it's another region of uh, low mental viscosity. So, Grace, you might be able to answer this one. Um, could you say something about can we avoid some of this ice history um, uh, viscosity structure trade off? Or how does it how does it change when we look at these areas of very low viscosity? if we're looking at like say the last 200 years of ice change or the last 20 years of ice change, could you say a bit more about the, what is the sensitivity to determining um, or, or, or let's say the trade potential trade-offs between the earth model and the ice model on these relatively short time scales? Yeah, that, that raises a really interesting question of almost what is, what is the memory of the earth? It would be really interesting to figure out how long, how long we need to go back to these regions. You know, is it fifty years? Is it two hundred years? Is it two thousand years? And that almost would help um, when we're thinking about our ice loading model. That in regions of low viscosity, actually, it doesn't matter if we're not quite accurate up until about two thousand years ago. But we need to focus on on getting that last two thousand years right almost um, because the residual signal from anything older than that it's going to be um, close to zero and um, so yeah I think it is really important to in those regions to focus on um sort of decade or two centennial timescales thanks so I, here's a, another question from uh from the online audience this is from uh, Greta Bellagamba and um she says, sometimes we have data about ground deformation from leveling or other, other sources that go back farther in time. Um, you know, could those data be useful? And are there some strategies for how we would uh, address those longer time scale data? So I think um, any of our speakers could uh, potentially address this one. I think any, any data on a longer time scale would be beneficial um, for integrating into the observations. Any thoughts from the other? Uh, uh, Rebecca, yes. Oh, uh, sorry, Rebecca's muted. Uh, is that your end, Rebecca? Um, not supposed to be muted. So if it's not coming in, could you type the answer and we'll get back to it? They think it might be with the headset. No, if you could just uh, type the answer into the chat, I can read it out, Rebecca. I'll, we'll come back to you in a minute. Um, yeah, Jessica. Hi, thanks everyone for great talks in this session. I had a question primarily for Grace about infrastructure needs. You showed um, East Antarctica looks like it's gonna have a nice GPS deployment, but that West Antarctica, or the West Antarctica Peninsula, as well as the Amundsen Sea is gonna, that there's a struggle to keep those networks going. And if you could talk more about the long-term outlook and challenges, that would be helpful because those areas seem really key to the data that that is needed. Yeah, those areas are really key. Um, in in terms of infrastructure, I'm by no means an expert, but I mean, most of the hard work has been done. Um, the GPS are installed, they're running and they're transmitting. Um, a lot of the stations have uh, had equipment upgrades that mean um, they're kind of going to be running for longer. So really, 
the, the hard work is done um, and it's just the funding keep, to keep them going in terms of um, servicing if they need it and data transmission. Um, so, yeah, I think this is kind of even even more reason to try and keep them on um, rather than pull them out and then have to reinstall at a later date. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, we have uh, Rebecca's answer. Uh, I'll read it out uh, from the chat since the audio wasn't working. But she says that in Northern Europe, the leveling data are already combined with the GNSS data. And I believe in most cases in Northern Europe, the signal is pretty linear over uh, timescales of decades. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they can be fairly easily uh, combined. Um, all right, another question uh, for any of the speakers here. This comes from uh, Nicholas Harmon, and he asks, would seafloor geodesy, in particular bottom pressure, help with constraining models in the oceans around the ice sheets? Um, and, and maybe also if you could say something about what kind of precision and accuracy would we need from uh, seafloor measurements to make them uh, be a powerful constraint of, of that um, sea level redistribution and uh, nearly offshore um, uh, uh, changes. So maybe I can, can say something about that. The there's There's two things to think about when it comes to bottom pressure data. One is, to my knowledge, the current distribution of bottom pressure data is pretty sparse. And so you kind of sort of have to determine how you're going to ingest that. Is that going to be most indicative of a large wavelength, which, which could be okay if that's true. But it, second point is you're going to capture very static sea level. So this is something we can interpret with GIA, but also dynamic ocean. And that is usually the point of that data is to also be able to say something about the physical, physical oceanography. And so if you don't have a model that's able to either sort this out or ingest it jointly, it's difficult to use, but it's of high interest. Great, thanks. Um, uh, another question from our online audience from Sarah Stamps. Uh, could Rebecca or another uh, talk a bit more about the importance of compressible versus incompressible GIA models and where are the differences in the model predictions? Uh, what are the differences in the model predictions? So let's try my headset again. It's working. Perfect. Um, yes, so compressible versus incompressible. Um, it's in, I mean, first of all, the Poisson ratios that we apply for the lithosphere and mantle parameters. There we have incompressible or incompressible. But it's also in the GIA equations itself that when we use a compressible material, we use all GIA equations, which means that the density change is included that comes from the deformation of the Earth. Um, Yes, so that's why it's it's more important to use a compressible or more it's more realistic to use a compressible model, and then the horizontal velocities are the most likely most sensitive um, observation that we have where we can see the difference uh, mostly, but even in vertical velocities we have small differences that are um, above the GNSS uncertainty level that. Uh, yeah, that, uh, it's, it's visible. Um, and relative sea level data, it's also important because when we look at longer times back, then we can see difference between a compressible and incompressible model. And even in stress changes, we see a difference between them. So is it really just uh, a sort of computational issues that keep all models from being compressible or is, is it is something else? Is it just computation limitations? Um, it's computation more intensive. Yes, definitely. And way more than incompressible. And also because the problem is that compressible models are not that stable, we can create some unstable modes. And that's why um, it's more sensitive to what we really do with a GA model. Okay, another question from uh, Nicholas Harmon. This is for Grace uh, Neild. Are the low viscosity regions also associated with volcanism? Um, that is, is there potentially more partial melt in the asthenosphere to lower the viscosity relative to a melt-free mantle? And is there some possibility of volcanic uplift signal in some of these places? I think that's certainly true for Iceland, um, which is associated with volcanic activity. Um, not, It's not 
predominantly the case in Antarctica. Um, but uh, certainly for the Antarctic Peninsula, it, it used to be a subduction zone, which um, it's thought that uh, this, the subduction zone um, kind of went underneath the peninsula and it shut down from south to north. So it's thought that uh, within the mantle there could be um, sort of a higher water content there. Um, and that's one of the reasons for the lower viscosity there. Jeff, you're probably more qualified to say something about Alaska than me. Yeah, I mean, I think in Alaska, it's not mostly associated with volcanism. So just low viscosity, um, just low viscosity asthenosphere there. Um, okay, another question uh, for uh, any of the speakers. This is from uh, Shanichiro Karato. Um, how about comparing the GIA from near field and far field to separate the influence of ice load history from mantle rheology? Um, what what are the sensitivities, or maybe say, what are some of the differences in sensitivity between the near field data and the far field data um, to different parts of the Earth's structure and different elements of the ice load? Um, so when you're looking at the data that is from the far field, it is in some ways easier to relate to the mental rheology and in some ways it's more difficult. It's easier because it's mostly large wavelengths. So you're gonna look at what parameters influence um, low degree harmonics in the solution. And that's gonna be a, a lot more lower mental than the rest of the earth. But it's harder because it depends on the sum of all of the edge sheets together. And so if you mess one of them then the entire set is going to be unhappy. Uh, whereas when you're looking at something like the data around Finoscandia, um, you need to know the volume of the other ice sheets to some extent, especially the Laurentide, but you're gonna be very, very sensitive to how you refine the ice history in Finoscandia too, right? So you have, a, it's easier, you have fewer parameters to worry about. Okay, we're almost to the end of our time. Do we have any, um, I think we've got all the questions. So I have a question here from Barbara. Yes, so I'm not sure that has been asked already, but what about uh, the importance of lateral variations in viscosity? Because we've been talking about the asthenosphere at 10 to the 18th and the regions that are not, you know, um, cratons, but under the rest of Antarctica, it's probably much higher viscosity. Would that influence things at the scales that you're working at? I mean, yeah, I, I, I think we will have speakers talk about that specifically in the second session, but definitely, yes, we'll have how many? Six order of magnitude difference between the low viscosity zones and the high viscosity. It's mostly shallow mental. Okay, do we have one final question maybe from in the room? All right, I don't see any more questions. Or I think we've gotten all the questions online. So uh, thank you for the to the speakers for three wonderful talks and uh, a really uh, a great Q&A uh, following them. So uh, let's give one more round of applause to all of them. <laughs>